21, that final section of the letter of 1 John. We spent, as I said at the beginning, four months now in this powerful little book. We still have two more weeks left in our um, Words of Life series. Next week, we're going to look at the entirety of 2 John, and it's 13 verses. And then in two weeks, we'll look at the entirety of 3 John. But today is our last day in 1 John. And so I want to summarize, think here as we begin, overarchingly at what we have seen in these five chapters in these four months in 1 John. If we could summarize, if I could summarize where we've been thus far and what we've seen, what we've seen is right belief. John has defined what right belief in Jesus is. He's shown us that right belief leads to right behavior following Jesus. But he's rooted it all, and he showed us that, that right belief and right behavior, they can only happen if they are actually rooted in the rich love of God. Out of first understanding that, as John clearly says, it is God who first loved us, that he alone is the source of love. He alone is the source of genuine non-imitation, without limitation love. And thus, that it will be only in the living God that we will find genuine non-imitation and without limitation love. That right belief, yes, it leads to right behavior, but only living in the rich love of God will allow us to either have right belief or live out right behavior in Jesus. And that's where we've been over the course of the past four months, right belief, right behavior rooted in the rich love of God. The question for this morning that John answers as he closes his letter is how do we, after we leave this four-month series, how do we stay there as we go about our days? How do we stay there from Sunday into Monday? How do we stay and maintain right belief in a world that is so full of false teachers and antichrist, antichrist, people who against and push against Christ? How do we live out our right belief? Remember, John reiterates time and time again that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is the Son of God, the only one born of God, that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. So how do we continue to live like that is truly our belief, like that's truly true? And then in all things, in all this, how do we personally just continue to preach and revel in the love of God? And out of that, how do we reveal for the world that that rich love of God? How will we, everything we do, think, say, and believe, how does it come from both a posture and a practice of love, of genuine, the rich love of God that is without any limitation? How do we call ourselves to the, the kind of climax of the book, which is John focused on the rich love of God, where John just has this moment where he says, see what great love the Father has just lavished on us, that love that, that calls us and makes us children of God, right? How do we daily have encounters with the rich love of God that causes us to say, that causes others to say in the deepest parts of their soul, see what great love God has, has lavished on me. What great love God has extravagantly given to me that makes me a sinner, a child of God. How do we have encounters like this with the love of God daily? And then out of that, out of the ways that we have countered and are being changed by the live of, rich love of God, how does the overflow of that from our lives impact and, and change the world around us, our neighbors, our co-workers, our family, our friends, even, even our enemies? How can we be so steeped in God's love that, that others are just drawn to God like a, like a bee is drawn to honey? How can we live our lives out of the overflow of constant encounters like this with the lavish love of God? Well, John gives us the answer here today, and he answers that question by saying, pray, right? Prayer. Prayer is the way that we just stay tethered and rooted in Jesus, to right belief in him, to right behavior in him, but most importantly, the rich love that he has for us. And before we read our passage today, the close of 1 John, I actually want to read another writing of John, but the words of Jesus that, that John pens for us in John 15. And as I read this and then read 1 John, think about the, the similarities between what Jesus says and what John writes. Jesus says in John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. 
He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be given even more fruitfulness. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. For no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. For I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you will do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. For it is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit and prove yourselves to be my disciples. And Jesus closes by saying, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. Jesus here, he gives us a call to remain, to abide, to cling to every word that he has spoken to us. To know that through that we are already made clean. That to know that we are already made right because of what he has done. To know that, that remaining in him is the only way that we are able to bear fruit in him. That in him and through prayer you can ask anything and know that it is going to be given to you. And then he circles back to the rich love of God. The rich love of the father that, that he has revealed for us. And now John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. For this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that God hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of God. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those sin who do not lead to death. For there is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that leads to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot born one born of God. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. And then John closes by saying, knowing all this, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. So we have to abide in Christ. We have to keep ourselves tethered to the rich love of Christ and away from the false satisfactions of this world by keeping ourselves from idols of this world. And prayer, Jesus says, John says, prayer is the foundation to how we do that. So what we're going to do this morning, the rest of our time, is we're going to see first um, three gifts of prayer that, that John calls us to exercise. He's going to show us that we should pray with confidence, that in our prayers they should be laced with compassion, and the goal of our prayer should be counsel to the truth of who Christ is and for what he's calling us to do. And then we will sort of tie a bow around the entire book of 1 John, and I have a few applications that I want us to take from the entire book and apply to our lives. But first, believer, as we stated, you want to stay in, you want to abide in, you want to bear fruit in Jesus. What you need to do is you need to get to praying. And John says you need to pray with confidence, laced in compassion, and you need to pray with the goal of being counseled to the truth of Jesus, even if it changes who you are, what you think, and, and even what you believe. First, confidence in prayer is a theme that John has mentioned before. He reiterates it again here. John has said before that there is no fear for those being made perfect by God's love. The author of Hebrews, for example, states that we should boldly and confidently approach our Father in heaven, even as majestic as he and his throne of grace are. John says that he writes all that he has written so that you believe that Jesus is God's Son and that you know that you have eternal life by him. John wants us to understand that in a world of uncertainties, falsities, fake news, and conspiracy theories, a world that, that has a great need for fact-checking because facts are often hard to come by and discern, that even amidst that world we can truly believe, not have blind hope, not wish, not guess at, not speculate at, not imagine, but we can know, we can believe in the deepest parts of our souls that Jesus is the Son of God. 
That Jesus was there with God and as God in the beginning. That Jesus was the breath that breathed life into all creation. Not that Jesus was amongst the created, but as God the Father has always been and has always been God, Jesus has always been and has always been God. That he, that this God chose to be born of flesh, takes on the fullness of flesh and all that it means to be flesh, while maintaining the fullness of his deity, the fullness of his godliness, that he's chosen to live life in this flesh, all that it means to be in this flesh, minus our sin. He did all that so that he could and that he did make the perfect sacrifice for our sins upon the cross. We know that we can know that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice for our sins and the sins of the world by raising him from the dead to life again. Right, thinking again of, of Hebrews chapter 4 and why we can approach Jesus on his throne of grace. It is because Hebrews says he is our great high priest. How in the Old Testament sacrificial system did you know that a sacrifice was accepted for the people made by the priest? It was by the priest, whether or not he came out the other side of the sacrifice alive. Right, whether or not he walked out of the presence of God alive. And we too, we know, we believe, we can believe that Jesus in the deepest parts of our souls and even in the deepest parts of our doubts, that Jesus is God's son because he was raised to life again. That Jesus is God's son and that through Jesus, through our faith, we too have his eternal life. That because Jesus has taken sin's best shot, all of sin's temptations, we know Jesus was literally tempted to the end of humanity's survival in flesh, right? He survived 40 days without food. Then at the end of those 40 days, he's tempted by Satan himself. Yet even then, he did not succumb to sin. So Satan ramped it up. He dialed his temptations up to 10. He gave Jesus his best shot. He had him crucified on a cross through death. That's Satan's best punch. And yet Jesus, even in death, is able to victoriously say, it is finished. Even in death, he was in complete control over Satan's sin and death. Remember, Jesus gave his life. His life was not and could never be taken from him. And in that, he paid the price for your sins, my sins, and the sins of the world. And on the third day, he picked his life back up again. And now to all who place their faith in him, their belief in him, he gifts to them his new and eternal life. Now we are not as we were prior to faith. Now we go from his rebellious creation to his loved, restored, redeemed, and renewed children, right? And out of that, we can have limitless, endless confidence when we approach God in prayer. That when we ask of God in accordance to his will, first we know that God hears us. So often in prayer, we make prayer about bending God's will to our will, that we, if we just keep pounding on his door until he hears us, eventually he'll answer us. Yet the truth that is relayed to us over and over again in God's word, and here's one of those instances, that God is not reluctant to give good things to his children, right? He, like the best earthly father, he is even more ready to give good gifts to his children. George Mueller, a, a fantastic man of prayer in 1800s, era pastor, he captures the truth of God and prayer well when he says prayer is not about overcoming God's reluctance. Rather, prayer is about laying hold of God's willingness, his willingness to give good gifts to his children. We have confidence that if we know the truth of who Jesus is, the truth that God's son has laid down his life for us sinners, that if we know this God, then we can have a confidence in approaching him in prayer. We know that he certainly hears us and know that what it, if we petition him in accordance with his will, what we ask is going to be as good as ours. Because he is not slow in, in the way that we understand slowness in answering the prayers of his children. Now, if we are asking and God is not giving, one of two things is is true. Either the timing of God's giving is different than, than your timing. Oftentimes we ask God for, for good things, for godly things, things that 
that God is even willing and is going to give us, but it might be one day and not today. Maybe it'd be good for you to have what, what you've requested today, but it'd be better, and God knows that it'd be better for you to have it tomorrow. So we have to know and understand that only God truly knows the, the answer to what is best for us. Or what you are asking for is not in accordance with God's will. When praying without an answer, really when praying in general, but especially when you're struggling without seeing the answers to prayer that you are seeking, you take what you are seeking, lay it over top of the Savior you are seeking it of, the Savior that, again, can be, be defined by love, that, that love lays down his life for another, the one who has laid down his throne, given up his life for the good of all others, Take your petition of him, lay it over top of him. If they line up, then keep praying. And as you do, know God is not only hearing, but he is actually working out the answer to your prayers in his perfect timing and his good ways. But if they don't line up, evaluate, ask the Holy Spirit, what would be a prayer in line with God's will? In line with God's heart, nature, character, and desire that can be summed up in his desire to see all people be saved and not perish. Brothers and sisters, we must pray and we can pray with total confidence in the God that we pray to. And we've just begun to transition to this, but as we pray with confidence, we also must pray with compassion. Let's hear again what John says in verses 16 through 17. He says, if you see a brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. For there is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. For all wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. Now, so often we come to this verse and we can get distracted from its clear truth and application. What do we get distracted by? We get distracted by what is, what is specifically is John talking about? What is the sin that leads to death? To death is it the grandest of all sin which we know is rejecting jesus christ as savior and lord and thus and always that leads to eternal spiritual death is john talking about a sin that we can commit in this life that leads to our physical death i think probably we could apply those the answers to this truth to both of those questions the answer to those questions are both yes of course, the ultimate sin that is going to lead to our spiritual and eternal death is rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We also know there's multiple New Testament examples of individuals committing sins that lead to their physical death. Think of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. Think of what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8. We read there that 23,000 people die because of their sexual immorality. But the point that John is making is, is not only that sin leads to death. That point is abundantly clear in Scripture. But he's showing us, he's highlighting for us how should always be our response to sin, both of our sin and the sins of others. We should respond with prayer. We should respond with prayer that is laced in compassion and without condemnation. Now, I don't think we have a problem responding to our own sins with compassion, right? We will show ourselves immeasurable grace when we fall short. We will show ourselves immense compassion and exercise prayer so that we can experience forgiveness and abundant life. But John, as one inspired by the Holy Spirit says, and this is the real challenge, that we should show that same immeasurable grace and compassion for others, even when the others sin against us. That unlike a world that is so quick to cancel and condemn anyone for any one sin, we should be as followers of Jesus like Jesus. Like Jesus in that instead of seeking condemnation on our enemies and their sin, even those who sin against us, we should actually respond by praying for their restoration and forgiveness. What does Jesus pray as he is bloodied and beaten upon a cross for those who have bloodied and beaten him? from a cross father condemn them no he prays father forgive them because they they don't know what they are doing so pray in a jesus like way pray for the forgiveness and the restoration of others out of a place of deep compassion and care for others 
And then as you pray, pray to be counseled to the truth of God and the Son. John uses these closing three verses of his letter to reiterate three truths that, that we've already expanded upon, that he's already expanded upon earlier in his letter. First, he shows us that children of God prove themselves to be children of God by turning, by foregoing their patterns of sin. He says, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. Again, that's not a call to sinless perfection. If it were, that's already unachievable by, for, unachievable by us. But it is a call to forego our patterns and our lifestyles of sin. As children of God, even as, even as reborn children of God, we are still sinners, we still sin, but we should not be habitual sinners. Sin should not be the pattern and the normal practice of our lives. In fact, whether or not God's patterns become our patterns is a way that John and the entirety of God's word testifies that we can know, that we can evaluate whether or not we are in fact God's child. Children of God turn away from their powers, from the, their patterns of sin. And they do this, not in their own power, but they do this in the power of God's son. John says, the one who was born of God keeps us safe. And the evil one cannot harm us. Friends, ultimately, the world is not under Satan's control. Evil ultimately is not under Satan's power. Death, sin is not ultimately Control, uh, under Satan's control. Right? Jesus proved that in his life. The Holy Spirit that lives in you, believer, they are the ones that have the power over, over everything. They have the power, and they freely give it to us to turn from sin and be obedient to God. The one who was born of God, Jesus himself, he calls us to abide in him, to live in him, and know that as we live in him, as we abide in him, he is going to protect us from the evil one. He's going to keep us safe. That if we are tethered and rooted in him, the evil one ultimately cannot harm us. He can and he will do things to us. He will certainly tempt us, but, but ultimately he cannot harm us. He cannot take away our eternal and abundant life. So turn from your powers of sin. Don't seek to do so in your own power. Do so in the power of God's Son. And as you do, seek to live out the principles of God's kingdom. John says, we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. And then he says, verse 21, it can seem out of place, but when you think about what John has just said, what John is saying, because you know all that you know, dear children, keep yourself from idols. Here it is. We know him who is true. We know the Son of God. We know God. We know God the Father. We know God the Son. We now literally possess God's Spirit through our belief in Jesus Christ. God indwells in us. He is the true God, and he is the living God. He is the only giver of eternal life. John, once again, summarizes the truth of Jesus and the truth of the good news in his gospel here one final and clear time. He says, here is the truth of who Jesus is, the truth of what he has done. He is God's son made flesh. He is God's giver of life. John says that's the truth of the matter. And then he says, because you know all this, once more he addresses us as dear children, and he says, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. What are idols? Idols are not only wood and stone statues placed on altars, but they are anything, absolutely anything, whether they are actually a good or bad thing, whether they're even family or money or housing, vacations, 401ks, even religious and churchy things. Idols are anything that we place in God's place. Anything that we place at the center of our lives, any created thing that we place in the center of our lives that the creator actually belongs in. Biblical scholar Andrew Davis puts it this way. He says, we modern people do not literally carve graven images and bow down to them. Yet we must understand how rampant idolatry is in our culture. For we worship material things just as they did, speaking of ancient Israel. 
For there is no end to the mansions, restaurants, malls, websites, sporting arenas, universities, investment homes, steel and glass skyscrapers that testify to our earthly lust. And the utter emptiness of such a lifestyle of delusion is, is exposed and ridiculed by God's word as powerfully now as it is then. We must stop and think. We must stop and reason with ourselves and with our idolatrous neighbors to present before our spiritual eyes the vast superiority of the living God's glory. We must constantly be evaluating our lives as led by the Holy Spirit of God as to whether or not, whether we have placed our, our, our idols and our heart's allegiance to idols of stone, wood, or material, whatever we have placed, have we placed something in a place in our lives, the center of our lives that is rightfully God? As we've said at other points in our study, we can even place things like our theological belief, our doctrine. Have we placed those in the place of our living relationship with the living God? Remember, Jesus has not left us just with ideas to ponder, but he's left us an example to imitate, an example to live out. So don't let idols, John says, don't let anything distract you from that calling. Now, I want to close our time this morning in 1 John by leaving us with five things that we've already seen and expanded on but things that we need to take with us from the whole of John's letter. Five things that you know about Jesus and that have grand implications and applications in your life. First and foremost, and it's got to start here, you have to know that you have eternal life, that in Jesus Christ is only found eternal life. John says in verse 13 here, I write these things to you who believe in the Son of God. Why? so that you may know that through the Son of God you have eternal life. Our hearts, for example, will never be softer than when we are directly facing our mortality, when we are facing or maybe even on our deathbeds. Then more than at any point in our lives, we are faced with the question of how is this all going to end? Where does this all so friends, whether or not we are on our deathbed with no good works or whether we have years of good works and even Christ-like works, the truth is the truth is that through Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ alone, you are able to know that you have eternal life. You can know how and where this all ends for you. You can know that in Jesus Christ there actually is no end. That life and joy and peace and intimacy with your heavenly fathers are yours not only in this life, but in next life. They are yours always and forever. We must and we can know through Jesus Christ that we have eternal life and we have eternal life to its fullest measure. That they are our possession. And then through Jesus Christ, we can know that we have a personal relationship with the living God. Think about, for example, what prayer is, what spending time in God's word is, what having the very spirit of God indwelling and living in you is and what it means for us. It means that we might not be able to see God yet with our physical eyes. One day we will. One day our faith shall become sight. But even before that day, we sure can be with God. We sure can be in the presence and have a personal, living, uh, conversational relationship with God. Prayer, for example, is, is laying out before God, downloading to God all of our desires, all of our struggles, all of our needs, all of our challenges, all of our doubts, all of our mountaintop moments with God. God's Holy Spirit is the way that, that he works to answers our prayer, both as we are praying and both in between our prayers. And God's word is the place where we literally see for ourselves both the works and the words of God. We have been gifted by God a personal living relationship. And we know that, that we have this and can only have this through Jesus Christ. And then know that just the same, through Jesus alone, you have the victory over sin there are any number of things that, that have and that will continue to try to defeat us in this world, health, wealth, sin, pride, ego, politics, 
conflict, division, false teaching, false belief, any number of things that attempt and will continue to attempt to, to defeat us. But hear this, this two-part assurance of God once more in verse 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps them safe. But the, and the evil one cannot harm us. Sin in its many ways that it attempts to make us its slaves, ultimately, if we turn to Christ, does not have the power to do so. Does not have the power great enough to overcome Christ and his power over sin in the world. So stop living in the power of sin and call upon the power of your Savior. The one who has already overcome the world. And two, even the effects of sin that are evident across the spectrum of our lives and world. They, they have not, they cannot, they will not overcome the power of God. The evil one ultimately and eternally cannot harm believers, cannot harm the church. They can do things to us, but they cannot take away what we have in Christ. The victory over sin in the world, it is ours. It is fully and finally ours through Jesus Christ. And then know that you are God's child through God's son. John says, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We don't make ourselves children of God through good behavior. We don't have to check this box and this box to know that we are children of God, to be removed from the power and control of the world and, and ushered into the loving control of Christ. But we know that it is only by his immeasurable grace through our humble faith that we are able to be called sons and daughters of God. It's only through him and his gifts of eternal life that, that his inheritance, that all that is his, that name that is son of God becomes our title. That we too are not born of God, but, but reborn of God. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you are then God's child. So know that and take that with you. And finally, know that as God's child, know that you know what is true, and thus you know what to pursue. As we spoke about last week, we don't need any more evidence than what we have to believe in Jesus. We're not lacking anything. We don't need more instruction from Jesus. We don't need a, an audible voice of God or God to do another miracle. We know who he is, what he's done, and thus what he wants us to do. We have all that we need to both know Jesus and follow Jesus. In fact, knowing Jesus, as we said before, is as simple as loving God and loving all of our neighbors, loving all others without distinction. The whole of the law and the life of Jesus is called to be obedient and love God and love all others. Right? You know this. Believer, you have enough evidence and instruction to live like this. To know what is true and to know what to pursue. To keep yourself in the true and living God and living out our eternal life today. So, knowing all this. As John says, dear children, keep yourself from idols. Keep yourself from, from lesser things than Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for the truth of who you are and what it is that you are done. What it is that you have done upon the cross. What it is that you have done in our flesh. What it is that you have done through our life. That you have not only saved us from sin, but you have shown us that there is a better way than sin. You have shown us that the power over sin and all of its temptations, even its greatest temptation, which is death itself, Lord, you are sovereign over that. You are powerful over that. That you worked and moved through our lives, in our flesh, in our world, living by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you live life in perfect obedience and perfect surrender to the Father, Lord. Help us to see that and understand that and know that that same power, that if we have confessed you as Lord, that if we are calling to you as our Savior from sin, that same power that you lived and moved and forego and turned away from sin, 
That same power lives in each and every one of us, that you have the victory and you have gifted that victory over sin and death to us. We know that even as we face our ultimate uh, physical end, Lord, we know that even in that, if we die in your son, we will ultimately then live in your son, knowing his eternal life, knowing your perfect presence and perfect unfiltered intimacy with you and the Father. Lord, help us to know those things, those truths to be written upon our hearts in a greater, deeper sense today and help us to live those things out in a more brilliant way, Lord. Lord, we pray with the power of the Holy Spirit encouraging us to do so. We pray that sons and daughters, that our physical sons and daughters and sons and daughters across this community would see the love that you have for us being exemplified through us and that they would be drawn to you like bees are drawn to honey, Lord. Help us to be your witnesses, witnesses that come back to you with a harvest of souls saved and one to the kingdom of God, Lord. We pray that a revival and that souls would be hearts and lives would be changed through the work and ministry of Peckway Evangelical Church, Lord. And that it would start within each and every one of us, Lord, as we become greater, more brilliant, more bright witness and testimonies to the love of Jesus the love that calls us to say, see what great love God has just lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God as unbelievable as it is, if that is what we are. So let us stand and sing the truth of what you have done and who you are, Lord. We do this and seek this in Jesus' name. Amen.